Welcome to The Lion Within Us, a podcast serving Christian men who are hungry to be the leaders God intends you to be. I'm your host, Chris Granger. Let's jump in. All right, guys, it's your meet episode time. I'm excited to have you here, so let's get right into it. So the scripture of the week this week is Zephaniah 317, okay? The Lord, your God, is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you but we'll rejoice over you with singing. So guys, go back and listen to the spiritual kickoff episode. We took some time to unpack that to see how you can simplify and apply that to your life, okay? And this episode today is just important. It's one we need to be talking about a lot and one we're going to continue to talk about a lot because this stuff matters. We're going to be talking about how you need to be the dad that you've been called to be. And what we had come in is this gentleman named Nick Adams. He reached out to me, and he recently published a book, and it's called Being the Dad You Wish You Had, Five Big Stones for Effective Fatherhood. And uh, he's worked with students and, and young people for over 30 years. And the wisdom and insp- insight that he brought to this conversation is just phenomenal. Uh, he instilled all this stuff down to this one book. And we, we don't talk about all five principles, guys. We unpack about three of them. But it's just really wonderful because he's showing us practical ways where we can lean in and just take up the responsibility that we've been given when we've been uh, given that honor to be a father. Okay. And so he's a, he's a successful guy. He's got se- several small businesses. He has a youth camp for Christian youth. He, uh, he's worked in, in youth ministries for a long time. He's got four kids, two adult daughters. He's got two sons in middle school. So he's just, he, he's a busy, busy guy. We had a lot of fun unpacking this conversation. So hopefully you guys are going to enjoy this one. Uh, sit back for you dads out there. Take some notes. Pay attention. This is some areas that uh, Nick unpacks that we try to explore together together that will serve you well uh, in your journey as a father. So enjoy this conversation with Nick Adams. Well, Nick, welcome to The Lion Within Us. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fantastic. It's great to be with you. Absolutely. So glad to have you here. And I appreciate you taking the time to send us, uh, send me rather a copy of your book. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and looking forward to just unpacking this conversation with you. So maybe give us, start us off something fun though. What's something about you that not many people know, Nick? Oh, wow. Something about me that not many people know. Probably, um, when I was considerably younger man, 30 years ago, I put my hand on a car that was be given away to whoever can have their hand on it the longest 50 of us started with our hand on it and like three days later i still have my hand on that car and won the thing so no that's kidding. something that not everybody knows about me i'm stubborn yeah. you said <laughs> three days yeah we started friday night and ended monday night yeah oh my gracious all right so what kind of car was it Oh, it wasn't anything special. You'd hope to have been something really special, but that was like a Chevy celebrity. But you were determined, man. That oh, was it. I My, myself and a, and a friend of mine did it together. He needed a car. And so we, we both got into this contest, and we figured that between the two of us, we could encourage each other, and then hopefully one of us would win it, and he could have it. And so that's that's what happened. So, I mean, the, the, the final, it was down to you and one person. What happened? Did they just uh, fatigue set in and they just went to slip and actually let their hand off of it? Yeah. And for some reason, like right at the end, I got this just real rush of energy and enthusiasm. And we, we got to take breaks every, every three, I can't remember, every so many hours, we got to take a five minute break. And so we come back off this break and I was just really energized. And so he's like, how are you doing? I'm like, oh man, like I'm, and like, I wasn't trying to psych him out. I just really felt great. And he's like, uh, and he just picked his hand up, turned around, walked off. <laughs> Had a funny. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting into with you. No, no. Right. Well, that, that was a, a lot to your personality right there, Nick. I, that's what it sounds like. You're, you are a determined individual. Well, I, I think there is some truth to that. <laughs> Well, let's get into it. I mean, you wrote this phenomenal book, Being the Dad You Wish You Had, Five Big Stones for Effective Fatherhood, and just would love for you to to uh, unpack this and also be like, what, what led you to even want to go down a path of writing a book like this? There's some heavy content here. So what led you down this path? Yeah, you know, I have worked in business and 
lots of different environments with me and, and I've worked in the church, I've worked in businesses. And, and one of the things that I've seen just over and over and I've said over and over is, you know, he's a really good guy. Like he's got a lot of potential he's got a lot of, of opportunity. His only problem is he was raised by wolves. Like he just doesn't know how to live life. He, he, he doesn't have the, it's not the skills for the job he's missing. It's skills for life that he's missing. And it's because he was raised by wolves. And I've said that just through the years. And, you know, I've tried to help kind of add to my employees and to build them and to, you know, provide some of those things that they lost in life. And, and so that's kind of the background. And then one night we're sitting at the, at the diner table, uh, having supper and we were doing conversation starters and okay. my son read the conversation starter, which was, if you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? And I mean, immediately I knew if I could change one thing in the world, I would create a world where we had effective fathers. Because if I could create effective fathers, I'd change the world. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of became the genesis of the book. It's just like, okay, that really resonated. That is something I need to do is to try to, to help fathers be more effective in their parents. hundred percent. And I'm sure, I mean, when I read the book too, there's, there's some of your personal story, your personal tie into this. So would you, would you mind unpacking some of that as well? Cause I'm sure that led into a lot of this. Sure. Yeah. I mean, my father, my father, and I had a very, uh, rough relationship, uh, at the time I was 12, my dad showed up uh, in a church parking lot and he was intoxicated and had a gun and he thought my mom was cheating on him, that she was going to church, then going out with somebody after. And so we didn't come straight home from church. We'd gone out to eat and he was enraged. And so he's there drunk in the parking lot with a gun and threatens to kill my mom and I, And which I've kind of said a couple of times to folks, like, I'm not really sure why I was going to get killed. And it's, you know, I'm not sure what it was I had done in that scenario, but okay. at any rate, he was pretty much out of his mind. And so we had to hide in the back of a car and we were driven, you know, out of the area quickly. And then we hid for him from him for months. And, you know, that was the beginning of some very rough times for me personally. And then, of course, for mine and his relationship. Um, mm. Probably from the time I was 12 until... I was in my mid thirties, you know, the relationship was, was really rough. I, I would see him after we got to the place that mom and I were comfortable with me, even being with him. You know, I'd see him once a week while I was in middle school. And then in high school, it was once a month. And then after I got out of high school, you know, probably as once a quarter. And, but then after I had kids, he got real interested in being more involved in my life. He loved my kids and wanted to be around the grandkids. And so there began to be a, the process of healing and uh, reconnecting. And, mm-hmm. and so that then turned out really to be a lifelong process. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, it sounds like this, uh, that's a whole lot there for sure. So, I mean, how, how did you first respond when he wanted to start coming around your kids? Now, I, I mean, that's a... That's a whole new dynamic there. It is. But, you know, by then, he and I had, I had been with him enough and had reconnected enough. We didn't have a deep relationship, right. but I was comfortable with him and, and knew he was, uh, at least in that stage of his life, harmless. You know, one of right. my, one of my fears growing up was that my dad would kill somebody because he had an explosive temper. He typically carried a gun and, so that was always one of my fears as a child and even yeah. since my teen years was that he ended up in prison. But, um, you know, by the time I was in my twenties and thirties, he, that, that was really a thing of the past. He aged and mellowed and, uh, so I wasn't, I was really glad he wanted to be in my kids' lives and he glad they got that opportunity and I felt like they were really good for him. So, yeah. Well, how did that healing work for you and him? I mean, that's a, talk about a traumatic story. I mean, you were on the floorboard of a car. I mean, he's, that's a, did you get, did you guys ever address that directly? You know, toward, we didn't really address it directly until toward the end of his life. Okay. And then kind of what happened is as we just reconnected and 
you know, obviously I had to do a lot of personal work of just forgiving. And, you know, yeah. I, I remember just it crashed in on me in my late twenties that, I mean, I, I have my own anger issues. And so my late twenties, it just really kind of crashed in on me that part of my anger is unforgiveness toward my father and, and not just my father, but toward my mother and my father, because my childhood was just stolen. I didn't get to have what every child should have, which is a safe environment to grow up in. And, uh, and so, I, you know, that began a process of me working on forgiveness and working through forgiveness. And, and so that was the first part of he and I really connecting on a deeper level was me coming to the point that I could just acknowledge, man, I really got the raw end of the deal and I got messed up and I've got some stuff going on inside that is directly related to the dysfunction of my parents. And, and that's not okay, but it is what it is. And so I've got to forgive that and figure out how to move forward. And so the internal work was first. And then, you know, as my dad and I just had more time together and, and you know, with being with the grandkids and there was more of a connection there. And then toward the end of his life, he ended up with cancer and uh, lung cancer and bad heart and just he couldn't continue to live on his own. And so I moved him into my home and he lived with me for the last six months of his life. And that was really the point that there was a whole lot of healing. Uh, right. And we had a lot of good deep conversations and things he wished he hadn't done and you know just some real healing and and i thought <laughs> mistakenly i was like oh that's great you know we got that kind of all wrapped up and got a nice bow on it and so now i can go on with my life and everything will be good but what i really found out is that and it's part of what's in this book i hope is that the impact of your father just never goes away Right. And whether that was positive or negative or whether you worked through the issues, he, that man is still impacting my life today for right. good and for bad. And so that's been a great just realization for me. Of, okay. Yes. A number of years ago that passed and, and I worked through stuff and, and really don't feel any issues toward him at this point in my life. Right. However, his life has impacted me. And, and I think one of the beautiful things to me, Chris, is that, you know, I've got a traumatic story of my relationship with my father. And yet I can just list you all kinds of positive things that are in my life because of my father. Right. And, and I think so much of the time we get just focused on the negative and the hurt and the pain and what we've got to heal from. But, but this man who was, I mean, pretty dysfunctional. Like right. really not, I mean, you would not be on your list of, of, you know, that of the year awards. And yet when I look back, he has left me a positive legacy. If I'll open my eyes a little bit. Really? Well, I mean, unpack some of that. Cause I'm just curious. I mean, obviously I, I, I'm very interested too. Where did you get your, your discipleship from around this for, for fatherhood? Because this book, lays out some extremely great principles, but I mean, that, that, that the, the, the legacy that he left, give us some examples there. Where'd you see it showing up? Yeah. Well, it's, it's things like my father was very generous and okay. when he, it, my dad didn't have any, uh, he was, he was a, we call him a dirt farmer in Tennessee. And it just means he, he really, he never had any kind of substantial material goods mm -hmm. and it's kind of lived from, from week to week. And, um, but what I watch over and over in his life is he would give to me. I, I never passed the Salvation Army back with my dad that he had put money in. When he was a, a big bowler and, and, and as a job, he was a mechanic or a bowling alley. So he worked on the machines in the back. And, um, and so I was in the bowling alley a lot. And so, if I was in the bowling alley with him, I, I just remember so distinctly one day something had happened to one of the friends that came into the bowling alley all the time and they were taking up a collection. And, you know, I was probably 10, 11, something like that. And my dad was who I know just doesn't have any money. Right. Reaches into his wallet and pulls out a hundred dollar bill, which I 
gasped. I mean, I still gasped thinking about it because for him at that time, that was an enormous amount of money. And and it just, it impacted me so much that he, he would always say to me, he said, you know, that people always have it harder than you do. People always have less yeah. than you do. Make sure you take care of people. People got less than you. And, and so that has just resonated for me. I mean, we have taken care of, uh, you know, international orphans. We've started an organization that takes care of orphans in, in Africa. And we've got, you know, we've adopted a young man into our home and we've sponsored kids through compassion and all kinds of other ways. And, and I've tried to live a generous life. And what I realized is that's where they came from. You know, yeah. it didn't come because I'm a nice guy because I'm really not such a nice guy, but it came because I saw model the importance of taking care of others and of being better. So that's that's one of the first things. Another thing that comes to me really quick about and the great quality that my father gave me, you know, I didn't have this verbiage at the time, but looking back on it, my dad was a minimalist. And he just, things were not important to him. It wasn't that he didn't have money because it, it just wasn't important. That was not on his radar. Right. And so he had a very simple life. He farmed. He had a, just a very run down, very run down home. I drove a really old vehicle, not closed it. None of that stuff mattered, but he had a simple life and he enjoyed his life. And we got to the end of it. One of the things that really kind of threw out my life, I kept thinking, oh boy, that gets to the end of his life. What kind of regrets he's going to have. Yeah. But he never voiced, I wish I had more money. To leave you. I wish I had an inheritance. I, he never mentioned money. You know, he, he mentioned, I wish I'd have done better as a father. I wish I had done better as a husband. I wish I was still, you know, I'd been able to stay with your mom and still be in your life in, in that kind of way. It, sure. Nothing about stuff, you know, and, and I think although my life is much more complicated than his was, and I do have more things, um, I still value some. You know, I value the simple times with my kids and I value simple times in nature. And, 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 and I, I get that from my dad. Sounds like he was really big on contentment. Just being content with where he was and who he was. That's, he really was. Yeah. That's hard for a lot of guys. So hard. We're going we're gonna to take our first break, guys. We'll be right back. If you're a man who's looking for greater spiritual guidance into how to become a better leader, finding resources that you can trust and then implement can be daunting. For me personally, I thought it was a lost cause and I decided to take the action knowing that I wasn't alone. It was because of this wide gap that we created our Lion Within Us community and the areas that we we're helping Christian men grow are incredible. For instance, we built ways for guys to lean in and grow through fun events like our daily spiritual kickoff, where you get that much needed boost directly from God's word. Our Bible studies that always focus on how to discern and apply what we learn. And even our amazing forum where you can speak your mind without fear of getting shut down or judged by the extreme rules of modern day social media. On top of all that, we know that many men want help overcoming issues and becoming stronger in many different areas. That's why we created several mastermind groups where the iron truly sharpens the iron. Our community is about having a growth mindset, accountability, intentionality, and transparency. In other words, just leave fake you at home and come to community just as you are. I fully believe in what we built. I see the impact it's making on men right now, and I would love to have you check it out. So start your very own 30-day free trial today to see how we can help you be a better leader. So if you're ready to take that first step, head over to thelionwithin.us and get started. Your journey begins here. Visit thelionwithin.us and I'll see you inside the den. So Nick, this this has been great. So thank you so far for, just for unpacking, you know, the story of your father and a little bit of your journey. And, and I'm just very curious though, as, as I mentioned, when I looked at this and I started unpacking it for the first time. You have these five big stones. How, I mean, where did, who was discipling you and where did, how did you get to, to these five? I mean, you start to narrow down the waters to these five areas. Like, I'm just curious, how, how did that whole process work out for you? Yeah. You know, when, when I found out I was going to be a dad, 
I was terrified, as most fathers are. Oh, yeah. But one of, one of the things that I just said to myself is, I just don't know what I'm supposed to be putting in a kid's lives. Because I've always heard people talk about their dad, and they say things like, oh, you know, my dad always told me. And one of the things my dad always, you know, drilled in it, I just didn't have any of that. Right. There was no, like, life sentence or statement or value. I, there was none of that. And, and so I was really terrified uh, about how I was going to know what to put into my kids. And so one of the things I did was just a whole lot of reading. You know, okay. I, I I read books and I went to conferences and I picked people's brain. And, and when I became a father, I was at that point a youth pastor. And oh. so I was watching people raise their kids. And and I was seeing what was working and what wasn't working and and, and yeah, really you saw both sides of the coin as a youth pastor. Yes, I was I was picking up both sides. And so um that was really good for me. And yeah. one of the people, uh one of one of the parents of kids in my youth group, his name was Paul Hively, and his kids were just amazing. And and he was a very unique and interesting individual. So I got him to come in and do like some some small group training for parents in my youth group. And I just absorbed all the stuff he was saying. And I recently got to do Paul's funeral. He died this mm-hmm. year. So I got to go to South Carolina and, and do the funeral for, for him for, for the family. And it wasn't until I was thinking about Paul and, and doing his funeral that it dawned on me that really much of what is in this book it's yeah. it's the stuff I learned by watching him and it's the stuff that he talked about and that he, that he taught and and yeah there's you know I've read a lot of different things and tried to grow but so much of the essence of these five big stones are just things that all lived pretty naturally you know and and so I think if you find yourself in a situation where you don't have kind of a, maybe a father figure that you can follow. You know, one of the things I would say is you read a lot and you find some mentors. I think church is a great place to find some mentors that can really help you hone in on what does it mean to be an effective father. So that's kind of how I got some of these principles. Um, and then as far as the five big stones, really, I just, I laid out the book and I didn't have that idea of the five big stones of effective fatherhood to begin with. But as I started kind of fleshing out the chapters, I realized that what we were talking about were the things that I didn't want to give somebody a hundred and one things to do to be a good father. You know, like right. I can't stand it's like I can't I would do well to remember five. <laughs> you know, if I can yeah. get two or three, I'd be doing pretty good. And so the whole gist of the book isn't really to tell you how to be a father, it's to help you think about the kind of father you want to be. And mm-hmm. it's to help you unpack. You know, who do I want to be? What are the values I want to get my kids? How am I going to come through that? And so these these stones aren't like do these things. They're more like be this kind of person. Because that's really with Paul Hively, my mentor, that's what I learned is is not specific things to do, but who to be. Right. Yeah, as you are going, you know, I was I was curious about that too because sometimes you think about stones, but like being a ladder, but you see these as more independent areas, right? That they, they don't necessarily build upon each other, right? No, and and now in my mind, these were these are all standalone. They right. they connect, but they don't actually build on each other. I'm with you. What's so? Obviously, I'd love to just unpack a couple of them with you, but I'm curious for your standpoint when you put them together. What's the one that you feel like guys struggle with the most? That's a great question. I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer that, but mm-hmm. but what I what I think is one of the most important stones mm-hmm. is is the first one, and it, it's just the power of being. Mm-hmm. And because part of what I'm hoping to do in this whole book is to help dads think about the fact that they have a lot of influence, they have a lot of power, just. By, by virtue of being a father. And then to, to get into that a little bit more about who do, since I have so much influence, since mm-hmm. I have so much power, how do I want to use that? And how can I uh, 
directed in the most helpful and beneficial ways for my kids and for the future. And so, and I think so many dads struggle with the sense. I think our culture marginalizes men. I think it marginalizes dads and their impact and their influence. And there's just a wealth of research that says that fathers have amazing impact in their kids' life. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's one of the big messages of the book is you don't have to be doing everything right. It'd be nice if you'd be trying. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. You, you might, because you're not going to do it all right. And you right. can spend all, all that time beating yourself up. But instead of that, just realize how much influence God has given you. And then take that influence and, and wield it in the best way that you can. And and God's going to use it for good things in your good plot. He will, man. I mean, I talked to a guy this morning, Nick, and he, he was out, just, just a, a guy who reached out to the lion and He's got four kids and he's just like, man, I, I'm a crappy dad. He's like, I just, I can't do this. I don't know how. I just had to remind him like, man, you are handpicked by God to be those kids' fathers. Like there's not a mistake that you are their, their dad. Now you may be making some mistakes, but guess what? We all do, brother. And right. Man, I mean, you can't, you can, you don't outsource this and, and God doesn't make mistakes. So, I mean, I think that power of being, man, that's, that is a big one for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I hope that. As folks read the book, they're just encouraged and they are able to focus instead of on all the things I'm doing wrong to be able to focus on, you know, how I want to show up and Uh what do I want this to look like and and be able to, you know, to focus there and to realize, you know, like we were saying earlier, my dad had a positive influence on me, even though he was awesome. Right. And, and, And so if you've got that kind of power, if you just focus a little bit, how much change could you bring? And so that that's kind of what we're getting at there. And you're right. Culture is really just trying. That's the biggest thing. I agree with you is the biggest pandemic or epidemic, whatever you want to call it, is fatherlessness and what's going on there. And I don't know when you look at, you know, even t- the media and TV, the way that they <clears throat> portray dads, it's, it's sad. I mean, they're, they're usually dumb or they're making mistakes and it's just, they're, they're, they're not leaders. They're always submissive and not in leadership positions. And it's just like, no, 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 that's not the Bible. The Bible is very clear uh, of what this, we're, 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 our call is, as men to be the leaders of our home. And I'm with you. I think we just got to, if we could just get that core fundamental understanding back to be the, the, the focus of, of, of family and what a change it would make. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and then with that whole, you know, power being the other piece of that is to be present when you're with your kids, you know, to, to not just be in a room with them, but to actually engage with them. And, and to do that, you know, sometimes I think we look for these great big things, but really we can be present just every morning by a touch and, you know, a, a little affirmation and, and just, so I'm encouraging that, that, you know, be present. Don't, right. You have the power of being part of it is choosing to be present when you're with you. Yeah. So that that works into that style as well. That's 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 huge. The guys on the show they listen. They they know what's coming. Uh, be where your feet are, man. I mean, you have to. And I'll tell you, these things right here. I'm holding up the cell phone for you guys listening and not watching. They've made it so hard for us to do that. You know, and, and I mean, if you have to take drastic measures, like put the dog on thing in another room when you're with your kids, you have to do it. I have to do that sometimes. I mean, I have to literally just put it in another room so that when I'm with my littles or with my bigs, because I got two older ones and two younger ones, like I, I just need to be there. You know, I, I don't need to be thinking about an email or or, or a message. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the day doesn't matter. That time with them is so precious. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's think about another, another stone. What's another one that you like to share with the guys and kind of unpack here? Yeah. But one that I always lean toward it is it's expound number four, which is, um, I'm sorry, big summer number, number three, it's a feed level. Okay. And, uh, you know, people, I've gotten a lot of questions about that. People that it more. It's one or it's like, that because they're like, what does that even mean? But what I, and trying to convey there is that an awful lot of the time, dad is kind of the the, the last stop. You know, he's the backstop. If, if everything's going bad, then, you know, what if your dad gets out? It's, it's that whole, 
you know, the disciplinarian or the authoritarian, and, and sometimes we get that kind of screwed up, you know, as fathers we go too far one way or the other there. But um, I think it's important to remember that although we have that as a part of our role to be disciplinarians and so, you know, to have the authority and to do those things, that the real goal for me, what I'm trying to do in parenting, is raise kids who I have. Let me start that over. I'm really not trying to raise kids. I'm trying to raise adults. Right. Who are adults. Right. <laughs> and so to be able to think about what do I want these children to look like when they're adults and mm-hmm. how do I want that, you know, what, what's that interaction going to be like? And one of the things that I want is to have lifelong relationship with my kids. That's mm. really important that, um, that we don't just kind of get them up 17, 18 and they go do their own thing and I see them once a year at Christmas. That's that's not my goal. Right. My vision is that we're going to have an adult friendship at some point when they are adults and and that's going to be a lifelong thing for them and me. And so as I'm living my life with them, if I'm really hard to love, it's going to be really hard to have that long-term relationship. And, and so some of the stuff that I talk about in there is just being willing to be honest, you know, and being willing to to admit your mistakes. Because how many people were raised with the dad who never admitted being wrong about right. anything? And that's so counterproductive to relationships. And so, you know, I, I work and if I realize I messed up or I'm my interaction was ineffective or, or out of place, then I, I'll go back to kids. Wow, I am so sorry. That's not how I should handle that. And just that kind of transparency. Uh, and and then to, to be a fun person. Because, you know, like you're talking about the dad you talked to earlier. Man, he's wore out. He's yeah. tired. He's beat down. He's trying to provide. He's emotionally drained. He's probably not a lot of fun. Sure you know, if just, life gets hard. And if you're in the business world or the church world or whatever it is you're doing, there's a there's not a day that something that hits you, you know, and that you've right. got to kind of rally. And, and so if you bring all that stuff home and you're just miserable, I mean, it's not going to be around miserable people, you know? And so you're, the whole point of that section is, are you being a person that your kids want to like? If, right. oh, are you lovable? Are right. you fun? Are you correctable? Are you open? You know, just all those pieces that are going to, gives you the ability to connect on a heart level right. with your child. Because if, if I can get their heart and if they know they've got my heart, then we've got the basis for a lifelong relationship. If mm-hmm. they think that the only thing I want to do is tell them how to live their life and what to do next, yeah, you know, a teacher can do that. Anybody can do that. And, right. and, and so I'm, I'm trying to, to be a person who my kids love to be with, that they want to be with. And that's not because a pushover because that's not loving you know? right but but because i'm truly in love with them and i'm engaging with them and i'm sharing myself with them mm-hmm. and so i'm creating foundation for life on relationship you are right there i mean i think we have to give ourselves a little grace as dads too i feel like we have to always have the answer we always have to be the problem solver and it's okay i mean we're gonna make mistakes and i, I love how you no, I, I tell guys as well just to to make sure you your kids need to hear you say you're sorry. They recognize that you you know I messed up. You know and that's okay. And just that vulnerability. I'm pretty sure you said that word too. That's a big one. I mean, and it's as guys we don't want to be vulnerable, especially with our kids. We want them to think that we're superheroes. But the other day, we, it's hard to have that cape on all the time. Absolutely, so hard. Well, look, we'll take a quick break, guys. We'll come right back. I find it helps me to have a guide at times when I'm reading and studying the Bible. One way that helps me is by using devotionals to guide not only what I read, but insights into the scriptures themselves. So we were blessed to become an author on the YouVersion Bible app, and we saw an immediate opportunity to help others with devotionals around the areas that we spend the most time talking about at The Lion Within Us. So if you enjoy the show, you may enjoy these devos as well. We have some guys that are using them as part of their small groups, 
as well as they're a great way to get conversations going. So to see the ones that we've created, head over to the lionwithin.us slash U version. And that's Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N to learn more. So that's the lionwithin.us slash U version to get started with your own men's devotional today. So, I mean, Nick, these are a couple of great stones, the, the power of being, you know, being lovable for sure. And then you, you talk about, you know, that atmosphere creating that. And that, I, I kind of related that to, I, I talk with guys sometimes that we're a thermostat, right? That we, we set that, that, that temperature in the home and we have the ability for either to turn that heat up or turn it in order to make it very comfortable. And, uh, maybe speak to that. Does that align here with, with what you were saying when you create that atmosphere of unconditional love and support? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, one of the things that I try to say to my kids every day is I, well, I absolutely love, I love you to peace and I will always love you. And, and, and one of the things that as I drive them to school, I'll, I'll, almost every day, say to them, what can you ever do that dad won't love you? My kids are, I, I've got, I'm, I'm with you. I've got two older kids who are uh, 20, going to be 22 and 24 this year. And then okay. I've got two younger kids who are 12 and 13. And so um, as, I, as I drive my 12 and 13 year old school, I mean, most mornings I'll say to them, what can you ever do that dad won't love you? And they're like, nah, they, you know, because they've heard it so many times at this point. I'm like, absolutely. There's nothing you will ever do that I will love you. I may not like you. I might not like your choices. There may be a lot of stuff. Like, I will always love you. I will always be for you. I'll always do anything I can to help you have a better life. There's never any questions about that. You know, and, and one of my kids is, is really struggling right now. And, um, and so one of the things I, I mean, I just pound him with. You know, if he gets in trouble at school and then I'm talking to everyone, do I love you? But am I happy about your choices today? He's like, oh, you're not happy. I'm like, no, I'm not happy. I love you. Be, and I will, you know, and, and so just to create that environment that says, you know, your worth isn't based on your actions. Mm. Your worth is based on our relationship. And, and I, you know, isn't that the connection to our heavenly father? And so mm-hmm. I, I just try to drill that into my, it's it, that, that I'm always going to love them doesn't mean I'm always going to agree with them, mm-hmm. but but I'm always there, and I'm always going to be trying to create a better life. Right, and that's so important. I mean, I'm with you. With our our older are a little bit younger, so they're more like um, tw- thirteen and twelve right now. So I'm dealing with some of the same issues. It sounds like you're dealing with as well uh, with that. I mean, but at the same time, once they've turned that teenagers, they they have to have that reassurance from their father. That, that, that they're loved, that they're fearfully and wonderfully made, that they just, you know, at the end of the day, I'm with you. I may not like the things that you're doing, but your your father loves you. And I just think that that's so important. We can't just gloss over the importance of speaking those words audibly and letting them hear that. Yeah. And and calling out what we see in their lives, you know, mm. to be able to say, here's the positives I see about it. And when I say calling out, maybe your brain immediately went to the, the negatives. I mean, you know, probably not you, but some of the listeners. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about calling out the negative. I'm talking about calling out the positive. Right. Tell them what you see in their life that that is fearfully and wonderfully made. But what is it that that you are uniquely equipped by God for? It? And to think that is so important in creating that atmosphere of unconditional love and support. It's that uh-huh. I see you. I don't just see your problems. I'm not just pointing out everything you do wrong. Like I see you, and I see your value, and I see your worth, and 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 here's in, in specific. Here are the things you do that are unique to you that are super special. Yeah, in there. Yeah, I mean the clock's ticking on this though, guys that you're listening right now. You you mentioned in your book, Nick, six thousand five hundred seventy days. You know that's eighteen years. I mean, it seems like a long time. I'm just here to tell you, blink of an eye, right? I mean, so just um, what give some encouragement to the guy who thinks, well, there's always tomorrow. I mean, just. What about the importance of taking action today? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Because like you just said, those I love the sentence, days are long and years are short. 
Because mm-hmm. it, when you're in the thick of the day, I mean, it's like, oh, my Lord, if I can just get to the end of this day. You know, if, if, if me and these kids can get to the end of the day and get to bed and everyone be alive. Right. We're going to count that win. That's you know, the, the days can be really long, but the years are short. And, and so you just got to start. And, and I find myself, you know, I'm, I'm 60. I'm, I'm on end of life. And, and so I'm going, wow, I really, I'm going to take time to invest in my kids. Even if I have to let some other things, some other good things, some other important things. But I don't have very many days with these kids. So when I'm with them, that's priority. When I've got time to be with them, that's priority. And so, you know, that's what I would encourage any dad to do. That's why earlier I was talking about this, maximizing when you're together, be present. Because we can't always be with them. We've got to live life. We've got to provide. There's stuff. And yet, in those moments, when we are together, to realize that every opportunity needs to be, I don't mean like you're always like up in the grill, you know, teaching and training and nah, but, but that you are present and you are loving and you are thinking and you are looking right. at, you know, what are the positives that they need and you are creating memories. Gosh, I love to create memory. I think it's one of the most important things, you know, it's super important to, to have those milestones, whether it's, because we do it every week or every month or every right. year, you know, it, it's it's a pattern or whether it's some big thing that creates a memory that, that kids can ground themselves in that relationship is there. And so yeah, absolutely. Don't don't wait. Every every moment passes is one less shot. Amen to that, man. I think guys one word that just jumps out to me when he when Nick was talking about that is just intentionality. I mean, you have to be intentional about this. You cannot outsource any of this and it's just something fellas that uh you uh, you gotta own it you know you gotta put those big boy pants on it on it and i mean there's no pressure there but just your presence is so key so key and nick i'm just i'm grateful for you for taking the time to, to put this together this book i mean uh before we wrap up today though let's let's do a little lightning round with you to have a little fun here at the end if you're willing to play along sure i'll try who does all right. Well, let's let's I'm ask little, you here. So, what's a what's a hobby that you enjoy doing for fun? Oh man, these are the kind of things I like. Um, I love to, to rock climb. Um, I oh, like, really? yeah, I I like to run. I run marathons. Uh, marathon so, runner, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do an Ironman. Uh, so I, I did the the full Ironman uh, a number of years ago, and so I, I love to be active and outdoors and doing. Stuff. Very good. So I did my first marathon last year, and I just did a half marathon about a month or so ago. But uh, I'm not built for speed. I figured that out, but I can definitely just put it in low gear and chug along. Me and you both. Me and you both. And hey, I've had this great experience. My my two older girls and and my son in law went to Greece to run the original Greece Greek marathon from Athens from from marathon to Athens. Uh, this past fall. And so they'd never run with me. And I, I talked them into running a marathon with me. So we did that last November. And oh, then wow. next weekend, my my two daughters and my oldest son are going to run a half marathon. And so we've been training together. And just it's, it's just been fun. It's an opportunity to hang out, eat the training, and to build memories. There you go. That's great. Well, good luck to you at your half marathon. I think I'm built more for the halves. I enjoy those a lot more. More. That's for sure. The full yeah. marathon, that's a lot of commitment and training just to get, it to, is. To get there. It is. It's, it's the training part. part. Yeah. Commitment. Because uh, you're putting, you're logging hours, you know, of, of, of miles. And that's just, anyway, good stuff there. I'm, I'm so glad you shared that. Now, you, with all that running, you got to get hungry. So what's your favorite food out there? What do you enjoy to eat? Oh, I love Thai food. Really? Okay. I don't love Thai. Love that. Probably be my favorite right now. I ate a lot of that. Very good. Very good. What about the uh, all-time favorite uh, movie? Wow, that gets harder. I love um, Lord of the Rings. That's, oh. yeah, love Lord of the Rings. I really like Schindler's List. Like, oh. I love the, you know, the, the end when he just realizing he could have done more. I just, uh, oh. it's, there you go. 
There you go. What's uh what's something maybe right now that you're currently struggling with? Because we try to be on the line and transparent in in something that when the guys hear people come on the show, they think they have it all together. It's always just good to show, hey, here's some areas of my life that uh, I'm trying to work through right now. Well, I mean, there's I could give you a list if you <laughs> go over the top, but <laughs> one of the things I've I've realized recently is I I just wish I had been more effective free life at saying no, at not doing. And I think one of the things I and this this sounds a little bit arrogant, but it's really it's coming from the ability of realizing I screwed it up. <laughs> but I'm a pretty competent person. I can do a lot of things. And because I can do a lot of things, I tend to do them instead of asking somebody else to do it. You know, sure. like and like, and this hit me the other day when I was painting the ceiling in my house, and I'm, I don't have, why am I doing? Right. And it's because I can, sure. you know, like I have the ability to do that. And so instead of kind of taking some of my own advice and spending more time with my kids, you know, I'm I've got a roller in my hand and I'm feeling stressed and I'm like, I wish I had learned earlier that. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And so that's something I'm still struggling with. Amen. That's that's a big one, guys. That's a big one. Learning how to say no and just to being able to delegate and good stuff. Good stuff. So how about this one, Nick? What's your favorite thing when, when you sit and think back about God? What comes to mind? What's your favorite thing about it? I love that question. And and again, it's you know, I I don't know if everybody would agree with this, but I love getting older because I can just look back and I've got just a different perspective. Mm-hmm. And and so one of the things I'm loving as I look back over my life is lots of places I didn't do the right thing. Lots of places I made mistakes and failed and I failed God and I failed myself. And, but God never failed me. Mm-hmm. And he never, like he never pulled away from me. He's he has always been pursuing me and he has always been coming after me when I've blown it or when I'm in a bad place, he comes for me. He's a good father. And, and so I've just great day in the last few years, there's just been such a resonance inside of me that I'm okay because my father, he's crazy about, me. and he's going to keep coming after me. He's going to keep, tweaking my behaviors and my mentalities. And, and although I can get in some real stupid thoughts in my head, it's so amazing how God will just come and whisper to me, you know, is that really what you want to do there? Like that. And so I just, I feel so safe in my relationship with God in a way I never have because I've watched, I just look back through life and see how he has rescued me and directed me to get me in Amen. I love it. Love it. Now let's let's flip it one eighty. What's your least favorite thing about the evil one? <laughs> oh, you know, I I think probably my least favorite thing about me in relationship to him is that I I misunderstand. I don't misunderstand. I forget how determined he is to destroy a lot. And, and, and the thing I hate about him is that he wants to take advantage of weak and he wants to break the weak and he wants to, to, to find those spots that he can just bring absolute destruction. And he doesn't want to just rip. He wants to destroy. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes I lose track of that. You're right. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's his whole agenda. So that's it. It's, uh, let's look, let's do uh, two more real quick. So what's that, uh, something maybe you spent too much time doing over the last year when you think back and spent like, oh man, I can't believe I've wasted this much time doing this. What, what would that one thing be? Um, that's a harder question for me because I try to be pretty focused, but, um, I mean, it's probably the fun, you know, I, I laugh and tell people, but. I'm your basic teenage girl when it comes to a phone. Like I just, I'm pretty connected to my phone. And, and so that's, that's probably it, you know, and, and it's not that I do a lot of, like, I don't do a lot of social media and I don't 
but it's just the thing is always with me and I'm right. always having to check it or send an email or, you know, so yep. that, that might tip. Totally get it. Totally get it. We're, the, the last question of the lightning reel, uh, Nick, is what's one thing that you hope the listeners remember the most from our conversation today? Oh, well, that's a neat, I, I hope that the listeners, it resonates for them that they are more important than they real and that they are more effective than they know and that they are, if, if you're trying even just a little, you're making positive impact. 100%, 100%. Well, that was beautifully said. Where do you want to send them to learn about you, to connect with you, to get a copy of your book? Or just give any links you'd like to, to point them to right here. Sure. Uh, you can get the book from Amazon. And it's just just search uh, Theme the Dad You Wish You Had on Amazon. And you're going to be able to find the book there. It's available as paperback, available digitally. And I hope I to have it out as an audio before too long. I, I really had hoped that it would already be out, but I just it, haven't been able to carve out the time to sit down and record the book. So uh, right. I'm, I'm going to read it. So, uh, But I hope it will be available on audio soon. So Amazon, get the book. Uh, you can find me at bean-dad. Uh, I can't remember my own. But it's bean-dad.com is, okay. is the website. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not sure where you can find me. And then from there, you can link to uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and different places. Okay. All right, well, that sounds great. Well, guys, we'll have those links in the show notes for you guys. And uh, Nick, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today before we wrap up? You know, Chris, I just appreciate you and what you're doing for the kingdom and for men. Appreciate the opportunity to, to be with your your audience and and I really hope that they can find encouragement and just strength and courage to be the best person of themselves. Amen. Amen. Well, brother, thank you so much, Nick, and you have a wonderful day, sir. Thank you, Chris. You too, man. Are you a manager, solopreneur, or business leader? Are you a husband or father? Do you have people counting on you? to guide and direct them personally and or professionally. Get the guidance and confidence you need at the Summit Leadership Development, an intensive, biblically-based mastermind group that transcends the boundaries of conventional leadership. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That's why we focus on the perfect, inerrant Word of God to become strong men and leaders in our business, home, and community. Join other men who are ready to speak and embrace truth. Learn how to refine your approach and become a beacon of light in a dark world in all aspects of life. Our intentional monthly sessions will give you an accountability partner to dig deeper throughout the month. The Summit is empowering leaders like you to amplify their influence in the workforce, home, and community. Don't miss this opportunity to become a strong leader in a weak world. Secure your spot today at thelionwithin.us slash leadership. That's thelionwithin.us slash leadership. All right, guys, I told you that was going to be a good one, so hopefully you enjoyed that. Again, go check out Amazon. Get you a copy of the book, Being the, the Dad You Wish You Had. Nick's a great guy. I really just enjoyed that conversation with him. And at the end of the day, I want you to think about this one question. What is the single most effective action that you can take to become an, excep an exceptional father? And I'm talking about an exceptional father. And that's who you are called to, called to be. I put that word exceptional in there for a reason. But too many guys, they feel like they're just trying, they're scraping by. I'm here to tell you, that's a lie from the pits of hell. Cast that back to where it belongs. You can be an exceptional father, but it takes intentionality. It takes stepping up today. Look, you're going to have days just like me where we get it wrong, where we mess up. Own it. Own it. And then do something about it. All right, fellas. So, again, hopefully you enjoyed this one, Nick. Go check out his resources for sure. And then head over to the line with us. It's, it's funny. Before I recorded this episode, I had a call with a gentleman. He's got four kids. I mentioned it on talking with Nick. But this just bothered me. He's like, man, I got four kids and I'm a crappy dad. And, uh, I had to reassure to him, though, no, you may have made some mistakes, 
but you are handpicked by God to lead those kids. Can't outsource it. They're looking up to you. And I know it's a heavy responsibility, but guys, don't run from it. Lean into it. And if you need help, the lion within dot us. Go join our community. Hop into a mastermind. Talk about the areas of your life that you need help with. And let fellow brothers in Christ just speak to you. Just speak, and if anything, just speak encouragement to you. The truths that we need to hear over and over and over. So if you don't have those guys, and there's so many guys out there do not have guys that are willing to speak truth, that are willing to listen, that you can actually be open, honest, and vulnerable with, this is what we built at the line within this community. We're going to give you some great resources, and we're going to give you the opportunity to lean in to be the leader God's called you to be. So quit sitting on the sidelines. Head over to thelionwithin.us. Start it today. All right, guys, get after it. Come back on Friday. We'll be here for your fun Friday episode, Good Little Willing. You'll enjoy some of these tips we got lined up for you. So stay strong, stay hungry, and look, keep unleashing the lion within. Hey.